All right, we'll finish the um, spinal cord here. And we'll continue on with the gray matter. So what we see here is that um, in, the gray, in the gray matter, it's arranged into horns. In the gray matter, information goes in and out of the spinal cord. Okay. Info in and out in the gray matter. And the gray matter is arranged into horns. The back horn, the dorsal horn, is where the information goes in. Dorsal or posterior horn. I'm going to stick with the dorsal thing. And what the figure shows you, it's receiving inputs from somatic sensory and visceral sensory inputs there, SS and VS. <laughs> VS, SS inputs. I don't want to write it out. We did go over before. Use this slide to decode right here. SS, somatic sensory, information from the body, your skin. Visceral sensory, your, your, your organs, your, your, uh, your contents, visceral sensory inputs. You can see the organization here on this side. They, they drew, they, they color coded green and blue. I guess I can do that too. Here's the green one. The cell body is here. All right. But the peripheral nerve is way out in the peripheral nervous system. But it's the one process that goes into the dorsal horn that we're concerned about. So that would be the visceral sensory. And the somatic sensory inputs from the skin, and they do the same thing. Here's the cell body in the dorsal root ganglion, and its peripheral nerve fiber is out in the nerves, and it goes into the central nervous system in the dorsal horn. So let's remember that this little bulbous structure within the dorsal root is the dorsal root ganglion. It's where the cell bodies are outside the CNS. Dorsal root ganglion. In neurophys, a ganglion is a cluster of cell bodies, always. Okay, whenever you see the term ganglion. Yes. Yeah, anything that's um, a nerve coming off the spinal cord is technically peripheral. Is correct. So I'm just writing that a ganglion is a cluster of cell bodies. So I'm going to move on. Um, okay, you have motor output. You have the lateral horn. Those are where the cell bodies are for visceral motor, VM. I'll use orange. So I'll put a cell body here, lateral horn, and I'll put an um, axon going out. And the largest horn is the ventral horn. That's the somatic motor function. SM. It's 
automatic motor function. I'll use this pinkish color here. Uh, I'll put a cell body there in the ventral motor. And the axon goes out the nerve. Okay, so those are four different functions. Two motor, two sensory. And you use the um, dorsal horn for the sensory, the lateral horn for the visceral motor, and for the somatic motor, that's the ventral horn. That's how the gray matter is organized. Information goes in and out. So for example, in a knee-jerk reflex, it's like you, it just information goes in and out. Re reflex, um, think of the spinal cord as a reflex organ. Well, things can just go in and out. Of course, things can ascend and descend, so you can, uh, it, so that it comes to your awareness. But, and that, but that's for the white matter. The white matter is arranged in the columns for information to ascend or descend. That's what I see at the top there. Let me read from the slide. White matter arranged in columns or funiculi, that's a word that means wrote or cords, so information K can ascend or descend. Now that's important. If it's a sensory function, which one is it? Ascend or descend? If it's a sensory function, it's gonna, you're going to feel it. It's got to ascend. Get up to your brain and feel it. If it's a motor command, information is from the motor cortex down the spinal cord to the right muscle. Okay. And so you have these three columns the white columns, dorsal, ventral, lateral, paniculus. D for dorsal, V for ventral. L for lateral, Paniculus. Let me write it over here. So, not talking about the gray matter, talking about the white matter. For white matter. ascends or descends. <coughs> Arrange the columns. Um, the D, the dorsal white column, call it the, the dorsal funiculus. Basic idea there. And we'll, we'll learn the we'll learn the columns, the um, the spinal pathways through those columns uh, in just a second here. And so, what I want to review first is um, in chapter five in the skin, we we learned about these nerve endings in the dermis. So I'm going to write this note for you to review the nerve endings of the dermis that we learned when we studied this picture.
free nerve endings. So what we had talked about, just as a quick review, the free nerve endings sense pain and temperature of the skin. Paper cut, or if the water is hot and cold, free nerve endings in the dermis. Light pressure, um, or hair follicle receptors have nerves. The Meissner's corpuscle for discriminative touch, or like tickling. Or the Piscinian corpuscle, which is, is lamin lamellated. <coughs> it has many layers, so it's hard to stimulate. You can detect uh, vibrations. And there's other things that we'll talk about today. Uh, proprioception in GTOs. Proprioception, I don't know if I talked about that. That's information from joints and tendons. joints, tendons. Uh, I'll, we'll learn about the muscle spindles in detail later. That, that's kind of like, um, let's say you're carrying, I don't know, a big stack of books. You're cleaning out your bookshelf. And then someone comes, hey, carry these out too. And then you can see them coming, this other big stack of books. In your brain, you're like, OK. And you start to anticipate how much more weight that's going to be. And then they shove it on top. And your, your muscles, it gives a little bit. It, it's going to stretch and react to the new load. And these pick up on that additional load really quickly so you can make adjustments. Like for example, have you ever had the experience of you see a big box, and it's really heavy because it's full? And you go to pick it up, but it turns out it's completely empty. What, what do you do? <coughs> Whoa! There's not, yeah, because you're anticipating a certain load, but it wasn't there. So you, you generated too much force, and you bang the box in your head or something, right? Because it was light. This is supposed to give you the correct, you know, you kind of stretch and react to um, produce the correct force. So that's kind of proprioception. And another example is, um, you know, you, you fall asleep at night, you wake up, you can't feel your arm because you slept on it. Isn't that a weird sensation that you can't feel it? That's proprioception, the feeling that your arm is there. Okay, when your arm falls asleep, you just kind of restore the blood circulation and the nerves start working again, and you can start feeling. So that's proprioception. Or like, I close my eyes. My arm is abducted and the elbow's at a 90 degree angle. Now, how did I know that? My eyes were closed. I, you know, you have proprioception. You know your joint position in space. There's always information coming from these things so you're aware of your body. I told what your dermatomes are. It's, it's the sensation of these different things, including proprioception. It's all mapped out. Do these numbers represent spinal nerves or vertebra? It's the nerves, not the vertebra. There's no CA vertebra, right? Okay, anyway, here are the pathways that ascend and descend. And I showed this figure to you before. It takes three cells for a feeling from the skin to reach your awareness. First order second order, third order. Then there's an interneuron, and it takes two motor neurons to get the information down to react. Upper motor neuron, one. Lower motor neuron, two. So we have to kind of learn these pathways because they're known. And um, I'll give you three sensory pathways and two motor pathways to know. The, the three sensory pathways is basically answering the question, how do, how, how do uh, sensory pathways, how do they sensations ascend up to the brain? And I think your author does a pretty good job. They give you these figures. And what they do is they show you a couple of segments of spinal cord, lumbar spinal cord, because those have the nerves that control your lower extremity, so they show you a foot. Okay. And there is um, a cervical spinal cord, and they show you the hand. These are supposed to be um, all sensations, like tickle, 
or proprioception, there's a muscle spindle there. And the information is going up the spinal cord. Medulla, pons, midbrain, cerebrum, those are all brain structures. So let me, I didn't teach the brain yet. The brain, quote unquote, I always draw it as a boxer's glove. That's the cerebrum. That is the control center of your body, your brain. And people already know this. But there are important subcenters right below it. We call the brain stem. And it's kind of hard to draw. I want to draw, it's kind of inside the brain. The thalamus, it kind of means like, in, it's called your in-between brain. Anyways, this is like a switchboard. It's kind of like, you know, you hear you use BART. You go to the BART, you kind of look which BART to take, and where to get off. This is, this is like the thalamus. Information gets to here, and the thalamus knows which part of the cerebrum to route it to. Do I route it to this part? Do I route it to this part? Do I route it to this part? Because each different part feels a different part of your body. And it's the job of the thalamus to route it to the correct part of the cerebrum. So when I scratch my thumb, there's a certain part of my cerebrum that feels the thumb. And if I ever got a brain injury, <clears throat> that part of the cerebrum died, I wouldn't feel it. Um, so that's why the thalamus is very important. This picture, it's right there. Then you have midbrain, um, pons, medulla oblongata, uh, below that part. It's too hard to draw in here, so I'll just put, when people say brain stem, part of the central nervous system, they're referring to the midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata. So just to give you a background so you know what this means. Because information's got to go up the spinal cord, up through brain stem, up to the thalamus, up to cerebrum. The cerebrum is it. Now that's the final destination. For sensation. And if you want to react to it, you issue a motor command. If something's too hot, you issue a motor command to flex away. All right, so how does information ascend? This is kind of the, the nitty gritty. Other information um, that you need to know is the difference between ipsilateral and contralateral. Information goes up the same side or the opposite side because we are bilateral. If you cut me right in half, I have a left side and a right side. So, Ipsilateral same side, contralateral opposite side. Side opposite.
What you may not know is um, one side of your brain controls the opposite side. My left brain controls my right body. My right brain controls my left body. And it's the same thing with feelings. If I feel something on my left side, it actually reaches the right side of my brain and vice versa. So the information, it travels up the same side or side opposite. In all cases, at some time, at some point, it's got to cross over to the other side. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the information does cross over, and if it does, the word is called decussate. Decussate. <coughs> Info crosses over to the other side. And it uses the, the gray commissures, gray commissures. I think commissure is 1M, commissure. No, I think it's 2Ms. Commissure. Well, once again, I'll draw my spinal cord. Sometimes um, information can come in one side and it can cross over to the other side using this gray commissure, which is literally this space from here to here. So if I draw a line all the way from top to bottom, the gray commissure is just this space here. Right above, the central canal, or right below it. That space there, where information can go from one side to the other, <coughs> from left to right, or right to left. So if it goes um, behind it, or, or in front of it, you just call it the posterior or anterior gray commissure. But I, I usually don't mark students wrong if they, they don't put it. Just call it great commissure. It's how information, commissure means communicate. So this is how information communicates from the right side to the left side. It crosses over. Okay. Um, all right, so here are the pathways you have to know. It's straight from the book. And it's kind of a painstaking thing to go through. All you got to think is that what's the sensation being uh, relayed up to the brain. And where is the cell in the central nervous system? So what's the sensation and where's the cell? Now, how many cells did it take to get to the top? Do you remember for sensation? Three. 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 And just call them first order, second order, third order. And just talk yourself through it. And um, yeah, well, let, let, me, let me show you. Hard to read. Let me write on the board. Um, these pathways here. Let's do this one here. This says dorsal column medial lumniscal pathway. Let me write that on the board. Producing sensory sensory pathways first. The first pathway I want you to know is called dorsal <coughs> column medial lemniscal pathway. Dorsal column medial lemniscal pathway. So that's the name of the pathway. And the types of sensations that use this pathway are touch, proprioception. Okay, so they give you a little foot being tickled there, and 
as you're writing these notes down, you, you can feel the pen moving in your hand. That's called proprioception. So these communicate the sensations of touch, proprioception. And so look at the first cell, the nerve ending that's in your foot or in your hand. Call that first order neuron. First, I'll just say first order. And you just kind of have to follow the figure. The first cell, the nerve ending is in the extremity, in the skin. But the cell body is in the dorsal root ganglion. And then you follow it up. And when it gets inside, it's going to ascend up the dorsal column. Okay. First order, the cell ascends up dorsal column. <coughs> Info ascends up dorsal column. And you follow the picture. It synapses to the second one at the level of the medulla. So that, that's right at the base of your skull, the medulla. So it goes all the way up synapses at the medulla. So it's ascending up the same side you felt it. Okay. So that's like the left side, so that's the left hand, right? So it ascends ipsilateral. So I'm gonna write ipsilateral for first order. It ascends up dorsal col column. Ipsilateral. So then it synapses at the medulla. But what we'll see is that the second order neuron I'm pointing to right here. That's where it crosses over to the other side. So for second order, after it synapses, yeah, I'll just say decasates. And then what it does is, remember, it decasates. We're at the medulla. Then it ascends contralateral all the way up to the thalamus. Ascends contralateral, contralaterally, I guess I should say. Up to thalamus. do is I go home, look at your notes, and then follow with the picture just to review. First order. It's right there, or there, either one. Well, let's do this one. First order, it ascends up the same side, up the medulla, it synapses, crosses over, ascends contralateral all the way up to what? Thalamus. Then it synapses again. Then you have the third order neuron. Synapses. That's the third cell in this pathway. Third order. So the third order neuron, it simply projects to the correct part of the cerebral cortex. Right there. to the correct part of cerebral cortex. And notice we're on the opposite side of the brain. We felt it on the left, but it projects to the right. 
Here's something to notice. For the spinal cord, the gray matter is inner, the white matter is outer. But look where it changes. When you get to the uh, brain stem brain here, it's the gray matter that's the outer and more or less white matter on the inner. It's the same thing up here. Um, the cerebral cortex in anatomy, cortex means outer bark. The gray matter is the outer, the white matter is the inner. So it switches. It's the gray matter where all the cell bodies are, and that's where everything happens in the outer wrinkly part of your brain there. Okay. The one I didn't do on this figure is this one for right here, muscle spindle proprioception. And this one here for pain and temperature, the, the pathways are different. So there's two more I've got to do. Hold on, let me uh, do that one. So let's do this one. This is called the spinal cerebellar pathway. It's information from muscle spindles. So the spinal cerebellar pathway is information from muscle spindles, another form of proprioception. Info from muscle spindles, proprioception. that information, um, it starts with the first order neuron. Its synapse is right in the dorsal horn. It's the second order neuron. The ACE ends up ipsilaterally in the lateral column, and it never crosses over. It goes all the way to the cerebellum. The cerebellum is receiving all the muscle spindle information. So the second order one. There is no third order one here, because you're not going to the thalamus. ACE ends ipsilateral. It's a lateral lead. It never crosses over, and it projects all the way to its destination, the cerebellum, not the cerebrum. They call the cerebellum the behind brain. It's the structure at the base of the skull behind the brain. It's not the brain. It's the cerebellum. It receives all the information from muscle spindles. That's it for that one. It never, it's, it's a simpler one. There's only two cells and it never crosses over. And the last one is um, the one for pain and temperature. Cut or light a mask to the sole of your foot. Uh, interesting examples. But anyways, okay, so pain and temperature. That pathway is for the spinal thalamic tract, the spinal thalamic pathway. So the spinal thalamic pathway, they convey, convey the sensations of pain and temperature. 
It's the same nerve endings that convey the same sensations, pain and temperature. If you've ever had the sensation of um, overstimulating your hands, um, for example, if, if, you, if you were to submerge your hand into a bucket of ice for three minutes, it will be so painful, the cold will start to feel like hot because it's so overstimulated, you can't tell which sensation is being conveyed because it's by the same nerve endings. So the same nerve endings use the same pathway. And whether it's pain or temperature, let's do this one where you got a cut um, on your finger or something. The first order neuron, its synapse is in the dorsal horn. It's the second order neuron that will decussate using the gray commissure at that same level in the spinal cord and then ascend contralaterally. Second order. So in the spinal cord, second order decussates ascends contralaterally. <coughs> and it's going to go all the way up all the way up to the valmus. <coughs> all the way to valmus. And then the third order neuron, for second, third, like before, <coughs> projects to the correct part of the cerebral cortex. <coughs> projects to the correct part of cerebral cortex. Remember, cerebral cortex, cortex means bark. It's the outer part, it's the gray matter. It's the same thing when people say cerebrum. It's the same thing when people say brain. Okay? It's all, it all means the same thing. Don't, don't let the different names confuse you. It's your brain. That's how you feel things. So then the question becomes how do you control things? And what I would do is I would study these pathways. I, I put questions right in here just to kind of like um, check for your understanding. for all the pathways we just discovered. And once you feel you've studied the pathways, you can answer these questions, then move on to the motor pathways. Understand that now that we're talking to motor pathways, we have parts of the cerebral cortex where you feel different parts of your body. And they map, they've mapped it out. What you could do is you could remove the skull cap, you could remove the dura, and you can stimulate the part of the brain. And it's not harmful to the patient. They could be conscious because there's no pain receptors in the brain pain receptors are in your skin. So they can stimulate different parts of the brain. <clears throat> and the patient can tell you which body parts they, they feel it in. That's why they, they're able to make a topographical map of your body on your brain. Feel it there, but if you want to wiggle something, move something on your body, that's the motor command. Okay. So uh, we'll learn that later. Here, here's the spinal cord. And so information ascends or descends Whenever, whenever they have blue, it means it's ascending up to the sensory cortex. And whenever it's red, the information is descending from your cortex down the spinal cord to the correct level. So it's motor and sensory. It's pretty easy. And you just have to understand, it starts here. There's an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. Okay, so I want to talk about these, these two pathways, two motor pathways. They're called cortical spinal pathways. There's a lateral one, there's a ventral one. Let's see here. Okay.
So for the motor pathway, study the um, lateral and ventral cortical. We'll do the, um, how about we do the, the ventral cortical spinal pathway first. Let me write on the board. Ventral. Cortical spinal. Way. Just study two cells, upper and lower motor neuron. And whenever uh, you see this prefix in anatomy, cortical refers to the brain because it's referring to, referring to the cortex. The cerebral cortex. That's what I've noticed over the years. Cortical means brain. So there's a pathway going from the brain to the spinal cord. And it uses the ventral uh, call. All right, so. Is this cortical then having some kind of a relation with the cortical hormone then released by the adrenal cortex? Yeah. Because those cortical steroids are released from the adrenal cortex. So cord cortex, cortical always means the outer part of something. All right, so the ventral um, pathway, it's follow the red cell here. Here's the upper motor neuron from the brain. You're issuing command to a muscle. So it descends all the way down, all the way down, all the way down, all the way down. And it gets to the correct level of the spinal cord, and it crosses over to the other side. So that's one long nerve from the brain all the way down to the correct level of the spinal cord. starts from the brain, they call that the motor cortex. Cell descends. It would be the axon of the cell. All the way down, ipsilaterally, to the spinal cord. And then it crosses over. It decussates in the spinal cord. And it synapses onto the um, lower motor neuron in the ventral horn there on the opposite side. So that's the lower motor neuron. projects to the correct muscle. So that's the, the neuron. It has to leave the spinal cord. So this is the nerve that will be a part of the PNS, the lower motor neuron. Will be. The upper mo motor neuron is not. It's completely contained within the CNS. So. Uh, That's the ventral, the red cell. Okay. Uh, the other, the other pathway is very similar. It's the um, <clears throat> the lateral cortical spinal pathway. Change that to lateral. I'll only release this. You start at the motor cortex. And it's the same thing. The cell descends all the way down, but it crosses over earlier at the level of the medulla oblongata and descends contralaterally in the lateral uh, column there. So let me write that down. So the motor cortex, the cell, <coughs> descends ipsilateral, ipsilaterally. It decussates at the medulla. It continues.
seems to descend contralaterally. all the way to spinal cord. And then it decussates. I'm, I'm sorry, it's already decussated. <laughs> then it synapses, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Okay, then it synapses and So it descends all the way. There's the medulla. It crosses over. The other side descends contralaterally. It, then it synapses. There's an interneuron there. Let's ignore that. The lower motor neuron projects to the correct muscle. Okay. Um, like, for example, when Doc does the uh, knee-jerk reflex as part of a examination, Jerk reflex. It's actually a tendon tap. But anyways, you should be able to answer this now that you know the pathways. Does the knee-jerk reflex test the upper or the lower motor neuron? Which one? You're doing the knee-jerk. Isn't it the lower? It's the lower. Because it's the lower one that goes out to the, um, well, in this case, the quads. Has nothing to do with the upper. Okay. If you have a correct knee jerk response, it means a lower motor neuron is going. What if that nerve was severed and you have no knee jerk reflex? Well, there's something wrong with the lower motor neuron. So, there's some more questions on the uh, cortical spinal tract. You, you should review it later after you've studied it. Um, these are just sections of the spinal cord showing you where these pathways are. Um, and this is just like a nice picture showing you the motor and sensory. We studied them differently, but they work together at the same time. So as you're taking notes, like this student is, I mean, the information is ascending all the way up to the brain, and the motor commands are being issued at the same time. So you feel as you're writing. These, these aren't discrete things. They happen at the same time. You can appreciate them um, with spinal, spinal cord trauma. I talked about this before. The higher up, the more function you use. And here's an acronym you should know, FLAP. Paralysis, loss of motor function. If you transect the lower motor neurons, FLAP means the muscle becomes flaccid. Loss of voluntary control. Atrophy means it shrivels away. Atrophy is the opposite of hypertrophy. And paralysis um, means both sides, you can't move it. Okay. Paralysis is loss of motor function. Damage to upper motor neurons of the motor cortex will cause this. Lots of um, lower motor neurons, if they're on by themselves, you might have reflex activity, but you can't control them. That's loss of voluntary control. You may have irregular stimulation of muscle called spastic paralysis. So muscle may permanently shorten. Um, so the person may, the, the joint, they may appear contorted or something because they have this spastic paralysis where they just can't control the lower motor neurons. In lab, what, one thing I do with students is we have a, a two-point discrimination test. And the only thing you got to know about proprioception is um, you have little nerves responsible for a patch of skin called receptive fields. And what you're going to do, you don't have a lot of time, but you have time to do this. I'll try to give you more lap time later this week. lab practical study guide, the first page is vertebral column.
You can continue to study that. I brought those out today. The second page is spinal cord. I, I, put, um, I pulled some off the shelf on that side, and there's some um, spinal cord models out there. So what I would do is, for the second page, I would start to study that. I'll give you more time this week to study it, because there's not a lot of lab time left. The third page is the upper extremity, and I'll start that Wednesday. But for today, I would like to do the two-point discrimination test. It's a very quick exercise, and there's still enough time to do it. Today, basically do it. It's really quick. Um, so look at that picture there. So you have a nerve ending. And another nerve ending. Maybe it's responsible for this wheel. And we have these uh, little calipers. And they're measured. Okay, and you can like gently on your partner do it on different parts of the body. And if one point is in one uh, field and the other point is in the other field, it'll feel like two points. Then what you're going to do is you're going to move the points closer and closer and closer and closer and closer. And as you move it closer and closer, what happens when the two points are actually in one field? What will it feel like, two or one? One. At some point, two points feels like one point, even though it's literally two points. And that's the threshold. And what you're supposed to do is to report the first point at which it feels like one point, and note the millimeters. And what we'll see is that different body parts are more sensitive. Like for example, fingers are more, way more sensitive than say your calf. Meaning that you have to put the calipers really close together before two feels like one. Okay. In the calf, it may be way further out because they're less sensitive. And that, that's basically the test. And um, you only need one sheet per two students because I want you to work in pairs. So that's the time, um, what time you have, just uh, at least do this one, turn in for points today. I have it right here. Go ahead and get started.